to New Life Christian Fellowship Church in Gaston, Oregon. Today, Pastor Jason will continue his series in Acts. Today, he will begin with Acts 13, 46. Now, let's join the congregation for today's message. Okay, so we're going to be continuing Acts. Acts 13, 46 is where we're going to start. So I'll let you start turning there. Okay. Oh, thank you, Sophia, again on top of it this morning. So before I start, we'll go ahead and dismiss all the children with Tracy. And as they're going, give uh, Tracy and the kids a big round of applause. All right. Father God, we're so thankful that we can come to your house to worship you, to study your word. Be in your presence together as one body, as one family. We pray that you would strengthen our resolve to serve you together, putting your will and purpose above our own. Focus our minds, open our ears, and prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Amen. Amen. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they, took the dust, they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. So, being upset at people, being uh, in a disagreement with people is very, very important on how we address it and handle it. And so you notice that these people who disagreed with what Paul and Barnabas were preaching... They went to the women first. <laughs> and, and it spread. Okay? And, and this isn't to say that, that women do this, because guys do it just as much, if not worse. Okay? But it spread because of gossip and talk and slander. Um, and it, the dissension, the disagreement grew. Um, shaking the dust off the feet was something that Jesus actually had commanded the disciples to do when they were uh, out there witnessing. Um, it was to show their separation from Jews who had rejected Jesus, that rejected the Messiah. It was to show that they were making a wrong choice, right? But it was also uh, just an outward expression that I'm separate from you. I'm not going to be part of you rejecting Jesus. So I'm shaking the dust. I'm not sure how they did it. The Bible doesn't, but I'm sure it was something, you know, they shook their feet, get the dust off their feet, right? They made a wrong choice. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit at Iconium. Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. So Antioch, Lystra, Derbe, Iconium, all part of Galatia, um, a big province that is now modern-day Turkey. Okay? They were fortified cities uh, to defend against raiders, barbarians, uh, thieves, criminals, things like that. Um, but also that these... That they also had um, a lot of strife, a lot of people trying to, to take things over. It wasn't that long ago when Rome took them over. Before that, it was Alexander the Great. 
you know, you had the uh, Persian countries that invaded, so it fortified cities. The cities were about 20 miles apart, which is a good day's uh, travel back then. Uh, so that way they could still take supplies back and forth. So that's, that's why most of the cities back then were about 20 miles apart. Gossip. Their words of dissension stirred up anger in the people. So if you look of some, some of the, uh, point out some of the verses back in there, it said the Jewish leaders incited. They stirred up persecution. Um, they stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their mind. There was a plot afoot because of a disagreement. They were offended because Paul's preaching, Barnabas's preaching, the gospel went against the teaching that they were used to getting. It was different than what they were used to getting, right? It was different. It was a change. People have a hard time with change. Anybody here have a hard time with change? <laughs> right? It's hard to adjust to change. When you're used to living one way for so long and something's different, it's hard to change. It's hard to make the change in yourself, right? It's hard to uh, not step back into your old ways. It's a challenge. And sometimes when we're challenged because things are different, we get upset. We get angry. We get frustrated. And then we stir up trouble. The negative view of the Christians, the apostles, right? It spread because there was a change. It was different. And it spread by gossip and slander. They spoke negatively, caused division, anger, and hatred. And it wasn't just their own anger and hatred because they went to somebody, you know, and, and shared that anger. They shared their frustration. And now that other person was now angry and frustrated. And then those two went to somebody else, and now you got three people, four people, five people. Pretty soon you have half a city that is angry and frustrated because of change and a disagreement. It pushed others away from ever knowing Christ. They caused people to directly sin because of anger and hatred. They caused that. They created division in relationships. Families were probably broken up. I mean, I know I've got family members who, who want nothing to do with knowing God. And I'm sure some of you have the same way. And when you try and talk to them about, about knowing God, about experiencing the love of Christ, experience the grace of Christ, they want nothing to do with it, and it causes a division. Who here has ever taken a disagreement and dwelled on it? You dwell on it, right? It's, it's, going, it, it, it's, it's inside you, and, and, and you're just sitting there going, man, I am so mad at so-and-so because they did this and that. And they just, it's, it's in your mind, and you're just thinking it again and again and again. And then you're laying in your bed, and you're just like, well, I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to tell them that. And you're getting more upset, and you're, you're just building this stew inside your heart. So you're directly, knowingly, and willfully disobeying God's Word by reacting according to your flesh rather than submitting to the Spirit. So I'm going to say that again because you may not have caught it. By us doing this, when we are disagreeing with someone, when we are upset at somebody, when we're angry at somebody, okay, we are directly, knowingly, and willingly disobeying God's Word because we're reacting in our flesh and not by the Spirit. We're not submitting to the Spirit. Okay? The guy that cuts you off down the road and you're giving him that five-finger salute, <laughs> right? <laughs> or one-finger salute, sorry. It's that one finger. It, it should be a five-finger salute, like, here, have a nice day. Instead, it's, it's usually a one-finger salute, right? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it was funny, is it uh, experiencing just... Not too long ago, I was driving home from work here, and uh, you know I've got a car that's that's on on my left that's behind me, and I got my blinker on, and uh, I let the car go by me, and there's plenty of room 
before the next car, you know? And my blinker was on for a while anyways, and so I finally get over behind that car, but the car that was coming up next was upset that I snuck in there and honking his horn, you know? And, and I'm like, what? I didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's so hard not to carry those angers and those frustrations, right? And, and then let them stew and grow. It's hard. In Lystra and Derby, In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. And in that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So I love Paul. Paul using his words, he calls out that victory, right? He calls out that freedom and he claims it. Stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Iconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to sacrifice, offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this. They tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provided you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some of the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So you guys all know that I'm a big New England Patriots fan, right? Okay. Every time when the seasons come out, the teams look at their schedules and they see, oh no, we're playing New England, right? We're playing against Tom Brady. And they begin to make their game plan against Tom Brady, right? Okay, this is how we're gonna, this is how we're gonna attack the Patriots, you know? We know that we have to put pressure on Tom Brady. We have to sack Tom Brady because he's a threat. He's a threat to our team. So the enemy, Satan, does the same thing to us as we begin to accept Christ, as we begin to grow into our uh, having a relationship with God, as we begin to become sanctified, or even accept Christ, our very beginning of being a Christian. We become a threat to Satan, and he wants to attack us. So he's going to figure out what button to push, because that's what he does. Whether it's our guilt, our shame, our anger, our frustration, our disagreements, right? Because we have those things go on in our life daily. Those are daily things that we encounter, daily things that we battle and struggle with. I've got some stuff that I need to work out with my own family still because of a disagreement. You know, I love my family to death, but, you know, something has happened between me and my sister, and and I need to reconcile that. I haven't spoken to my sister in about five years. Just over a disagreement. And it's those little buttons that Satan knows how to push to keep us apart. Satan's attacks come in many, many forms. And I'm sure that he was hoping that by calling Barnabas and Paul gods, saying they were Zeus and Hermes, you know, that, that, that's, that's an ego thing, a pride thing. I mean, being called a god, you know, that'd be kind of cool, you know, thinking, right? Oh man, they just called me a god, that's so awesome. But no, uh, not at all what Paul and Barnabas did, right? They got, they, they got frustrated by that, they tore their own clothes. That's a sign of, uh, of, of remorse, right? Um, it's a sign of mourning when they would tear their clothes and put ash, uh, ashes on. 
Um, so they were upset that they were called gods. They didn't accept that. But the dissension, the disagreement had spread so much that the ego attack didn't work, but that attack did. They dragged Paul outside the city gates and stoned him. And so I spoke on words last week, right, and how our words matter, and how uh, when we're in a disagreement, we have to be careful what we say. And if you think about it, I told you how Paul was passionate. Well, it didn't say that Barnabas got stoned. It didn't say that the other apostles got stoned. They said Paul got stoned. So Paul's passion probably caused him to be the one to be stoned. Paul may not have always spoken in the right way. He probably got under people's skin. Uh, he probably poked the bear, as you call it, right? And that's what caused him to be dragged outside the city and be stoned. And Paul, being stubborn as we are, what did Paul do? He got back up and went back inside the city. Well, and I'm glad he did it for God. Right? If, he, if he did that for his own human pride, right? his own human uh, self, it would be a mistake. But he did it for God. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. When they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. So here they're, they're traveling, right? They're not spreading hate. They're not spreading depression. They're not spreading disagreement. They're encouraging. They're lifting people up. And they're praying. And they're fasting. And they're getting... They're raising up leaders to help other people. So you have two examples of how we need to behave. Two examples of how we need to live. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to, to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So how do you handle disagreements? It's a very, very important question we all have to ask ourselves. How do we handle disagreements? Do you spread them? How important is your opinion of other people that you have to share it? Is your opinion so important that you need to share it with other people? Or do you need to share it with God? Is what you're going to share about someone uplifting and encouraging? Or are you going to drag that person through the mud because of your opinion and your disagreement? So many times that happens, especially in a workplace. I know uh, being in, in management through the years, you know, I mean, no matter how hard I try to do things for people and, and, and treat people the right way, I will fail, I will fail, but the second I fail, my name is dragged through the mud, right? Um, when we look at this, what did Paul and Barnabas do? They entered into a debate. It was a sharp dispute, so it wasn't, you know, hey, I just disagree with you. They, they were probably very passionate about their disagreement but they went and talked to the people directly that they were in disagreement with. 
okay? They didn't share with, you know, Harry Lowe and Harry Moe and Curly, right? They went directly to the people that they were in disagreement with. And they had that sharp dispute and that debate. He didn't spread gossip. He didn't call them out by name, right? Here in the Word, it doesn't say that those specific people, he didn't name them. It said some people. So those people remained, remained anonymous because it would not be right to call them out and spread that, right? They're not spreading that hate. They have a disagreement. They, ha they go to that person and have a sharp debate, a dispute with them. And even in the writing, they remain anonymous. When that didn't resolve it, their next step was to go to their leadership to get answers. Now, did Paul always behave in this way? I don't think so. I think he had to learn it. I mean, he was stoned and beaten multiple times, so I, I think he had to learn a lesson, just like we all do. We all have to learn how to handle disagreements. We have to learn how to handle our anger and our frustration. And it was probably somebody like Barnabas, because remember, do you guys remember what Barnabas is known for? What was he called? Anybody? He was called the son of encouragement. He was an encourager. He lifted people up. And so he probably provided very wise counsel and encouragement for Paul and taught him some of these things. So then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and, dressed and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that we, neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe that it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Right. So we are saved by grace, nothing else. We are saved by the name of Lord Jesus Christ. When we call on Him, when we ask for His, for His forgiveness, we are saved, we are cleansed, okay? So this debate was a very, very important one because uh, the Mosaic laws had their time and their place before Jesus, okay? And they're no longer a requirement that uh, would have been placed on us. It would have been unfair, just as they said here. Because even though uh, before Jesus, right, the Jewish people, they were circumcised, they performed rituals to be clean, but they weren't really clean. Okay? There was no uh, blood sacrifice other than a bull or a lamb you know, that they would, they would personally sacrifice. That was the only way for them to have that atonement. Jesus replaced that. So why put on an undue hardship that their ancestors couldn't even follow? So the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finish, finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people from his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling to them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. 
So the disagreement, the dispute, they took it to the leaders. The men of God, they looked at the scriptures, and they took the problem to God. They found the answer in God. It gave them a clear resolution to the problem, and it resolved the disagreement. It fixed it. The battle stopped. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some from their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. To the apostles, elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they, sent, they were sent off by the believers with a blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So Paul wanted to take another journey. He wanted to go back and, and revisit and encourage and lift people up where they had been. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and not continued on with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left. And commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. A sharp disagreement caused the division between Paul and Barnabas. Two men that had been together for so long and had gone through so much together in the name of the Lord. But a sharp disagreement divided them. Do you know that in the United States, there are more lawyers than any other country in the world per capita? That means for every person, there's about 320, 320 people to one lawyer in the United States. That's how many lawyers we have. Now, that's not saying anything bad about lawyers, right? But you can think of the, uh, the lady that went through the McDonald's drive through Her name was uh, Stella Liebeck. She sued McDonald's in 1992. She took home $2.9 million in damages because the coffee was hot. Now, I like cold coffee myself, right? But I'm sure hot coffee is usually what people expect. But she sued... McDonald's because they gave her hot coffee. Okay? How are we supposed to resolve disagreements as Christians? Isn't there a better way than to create dissension? Isn't there a better way than to, you know what, I don't like that change, that change is so hard, it's different, you know, I can't believe, why can't they be like so-and-so? And we can just spread that. Can't, aren't we supposed to do different than that? Aren't we supposed to be better than that? So, the book of James says that the source of fighting and wars among us is the cravings 
that are at war within us. It's our own hearts, our own minds that, that cause that bitterness. We hang on to it. Jesus had a very good message about resolving disagreements, especially when it came to Christians, and it's in the book of Matthew. I'm going to read from the message. Typically, I stick to the NIV, but the message really drove this one home very, very clearly, okay? So it's Matthew 5, 21 through 24, and then I'm going to read Matthew 18, 15, and 17. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you might just find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering, and you suddenly remember a grudge to a friend, a fr- remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Is it because... Maybe God doesn't truly accept your offering if you have that anger and bitterness in you. If a fellow believer hurts you, go tell him and work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along with you so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest and try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch. Confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. So four key points here to sum these scriptures up. Resolve your disputes quickly. Resolve them face-to-face, one-on-one, and get help. Quickly, face-to-face, one-on-one, get help. Okay? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned that a believer who harbored anger against their neighbor or brother or sister was just as guilty in God's eyes as committing murder. When you hold that anger and resentment against someone, it's like it's murder. Um, Star Wars fans, my favorite verse, right? Anger leads to hate, hate leads to the dark side, okay? It, It builds in there, okay? When someone has wronged you, do you have the right to be angry? You've got to forgive. There are those of us who have held on to anger and resentment for so long that we literally do not know what our life would be like without being bitter, without being angry and frustrated at the whole world. Because that's how they are. You guys, I mean, I've known many people like that, and I found myself being that way at times, right? Over certain situations that I'm in, you know, I, all I have to do sometimes is just open up a door and, and then stuff just, ah, I get so angry. And I start complaining about it. I start complaining about what's inside that door and what a mess it is and how horrible it is, and I just start getting bitter and angry. I am totally just giving in to Satan when I do that. I am opening another doorway that Satan can enter because I'm not handling it the right way. As Christians, we have a responsibility to resolve our anger right away. We shouldn't share our anger. We shouldn't share our offense and cause the division. Now, I know there's some people here with some very, very painful backgrounds, and I don't want to minimize the hurt that you've been through, the hurt you've experienced. It's there. It's very, very uh, hard. Right? Some of you have been through abusive relationships. You've had, you've had just stuff in your life that is unbelievable. But what Jesus calls for in this passage is definitely not easy, and it may require professional help to accomplish. But Jesus is very clear in his words. Conflict has to be resolved quickly. In verses 23 and 24, he implies that... Uh, Settling this conflict is more important than worship. 
it's so important that in the middle of a worship service, if you have that problem, you should get it resolved, get it reconciled. God won't even accept our worship until we make things right with our brothers and sisters. That's what the passage seems to be saying. John 4.20, 1 John 4.20 backs it up. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. And what is a liar? A sinner. So when you have that anger against someone and you haven't forgiven them, you're sinning. You've got to forgive. Act quickly. How quick is quick? Ephesians 4.26 says not to let the sun go down on your anger. And that's a good tool for marriage, right? Um, when you have a disagreement with your spouse, right? It, facing opposite sides of the beds, not saying, you know, I love you or good night, and just, <laughs> you know, that does no good for a marriage. So resolve it quickly. Don't go to sleep angry. One on one. Pay attention to the second part of Matthew 18, 15. Just between the two of you, raise your hands if you have ever talked about someone before you talked to someone that you had a disagreement with. When you had a disagreement with someone, have you talked to someone instead of that someone? I have. And then, let's be honest here again. Um, we need to have some mutual accountability here, right? We've all done it. Um, and then we've probably turned it into a prayer request, right? Um, I need you guys to pray for my husband. Uh, he's being such a jerk, he called me an elephant. Uh, no matter how we dress it up, spiritualize it, it is wrong to talk about someone instead of talking to someone. The one exception to this rule is when you talk to God. You talk to God about the conflict you're having. It's a very necessary step. Pray about the conflict before you address it with that person. Go into that prayer humbly. Ask God to show you what you need to work on. What parts do you need to fix that had a role in that disagreement? Um, one of the things I always learned uh, is if you point at someone blaming somebody for something, usually you have one finger up. Yeah, I'll point at you. You're safe. <laughs> so when I'm pointing at my wife, okay, I've got one finger pointing at her, but I've got three pointing at me. Okay? I have to own part of that. Any disagreement I have, right, in the military they do a knife hand. You know, it's, it's this, you know, because they, they're not going to have anything pointing back at themselves. It's always, you know. Um, so there's this marriage counselor who uh, he would ask each spouse to own 10% of the problem. Okay? 10%, they would come and, you know, the husband would complain about this, the wife would complain about this, okay? So, uh, husband, you need to own 10% of what the wife is complaining about. Wife, you need to own 10% of what the spouse is complaining about. The reason why is that the next time they meet, 20% of the problem would already be fixed. Okay? Resolve your anger quickly. So basic do's and don'ts. Work to resolve it quickly. Don't let it stew and simmer. Talk to the person. Don't talk about the person. Talk to God about yourself. Then ask God for wisdom in how to talk to them. Those things will help you to resolve the conflict and, and get that peace that you, that you need. We all need that peace. And if we're building that anger and resentment in us, we're never going to get that peace. All right. So today I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer, and then I'll, because it's St. Patty's Day, I'll, I'll share an Irish blessing with you guys, okay? So Father God, we thank you for your peace and your grace. Help us to give grace 
to others when we're offended. Father God, help us to forgive others when they've offended us. But most importantly, help us to forgive ourselves for mistakes that we've made in our lives. Help us to forgive ourselves when we know we've done things that have hurt people. Help us to take that grace and let it fill our hearts so that we can experience your peace and your love, your comfort. Because we know that when we're carrying that guilt around for what we've done, that we, we struggle finding that peace. We struggle feeling your love. So before we can experience that truly, we know that we have to lay down that guilt because it doesn't belong in us. Because by accepting you into our lives, that guilt no longer has a place in our lives. So help us to forgive ourselves. Help us to forgive those who have offended us. Help us resolve our issues quickly. And help us to share your love with this world. Amen. Amen.